I won't tell you a lot about Irwin because his story is going to come out over the course of the evening, so I won't duplicate that. Uh, but before I start, I do want to tell you one quick story about Irwin. Um, I am just uh, consider myself very lucky to have known Irwin for about 10 years. I was trying to figure out. I've, uh, I first licensed him stuff, the POM OS, and then he licensed me stuff, CDMA. So uh, worked out for both of us. Um, and I've been bugging him for two years to come here and do this talk, so I'm really thrilled to have him here. But the story I want to tell you dates back a, about a year and a half ago where um, I happened to go to a birthday celebration for Irwin. And uh, I won't tell you which one. Irwin can tell you if he wants to. And uh, <laughs> we... Uh, <laughs> I, I do a lot of public speaking myself, and one of my pet peeves when I do public speaking is cell phones going off. And Erwin was speaking at this event with lots and lots of people, a huge thing, and suddenly a cell phone goes off. And I'm, I'm just horrified. And Erwin stops mid-sentence, and I'm thinking, oh, boy, he's going to let him have it. He stops, he looks up, and he says, what a beautiful sound. <laughs> So please, for my sake, but not for Irwin's, I want to ask you to please turn off your trios and uh, any other ringing device that you have this evening. I now want to introduce to you Elizabeth Corcoran. Elizabeth is an award-winning journalist who's covered the high-tech world for more than 15 years. She joined Forbes as a bureau chief in 1999 and currently contributes longer features and science-oriented articles to the magazine. Previously, she was the lead technology writer for the Washington Post. She's a science writer at heart, has been a staff writer at both Scientific American Magazine and IEEE Spectrum. I'm sure, there's many readers of IEEE Spectrum here. She also spent a year at MIT as a fellow in the Knight Science Journalism Program. She's a frequent speaker at industry conferences and has been a featured commentator on both television and radio business news shows, including Forbes on Fox. She has a bachelor's degree in economics from Georgetown University. And she will tell you more about Irwin. So please join me in welcoming Elizabeth and Irwin. Thank you. And, and thank you all for coming, especially on such a beautiful afternoon. It really shows that, that you guys are the smart ones and know where the really interesting things are going on. Uh, Donna did such a fantastic job of telling you about the computer museum that you may be wondering why I'm sitting here with a cell phone guy. It gets worse. <laughs> he actually started studying hotel management uh, at Cornell University. Fortunately, he changed his mind a year or so into it and wound up studying electrical engineering, uh, went on to become a professor at MIT, and uh, was very closely associated with Claude Shannon, who I'm sure everyone knows is in many ways the father of communication theory. Um, I'm going to fast forward because by 1985, he started not his first, but his second company, Qualcomm. And uh, at the time, I think he told his wife, maybe it'll be a little company, 100 people or so. Um, jump ahead a little bit more. Qualcomm, of course, is now a company that has a market cap of close to 60 billion or more than 60 billion dollars. Uh, and uh, employs more than 7,600 7, people and is obviously a, a huge phenomenon in our world. What I thought that we would like to do, and, and, and I've talked to a number of his friends and people about Irwin, and they have lun, lun, wonderful things to say about him. Things like, he's the smartest guy I've ever met. He's ethical. Um, and then there are people who say, Irwin Jacobs caused confusion in the marketplace. <laughs> so we're going to talk about all of these things. And in particular, we're going to talk about a big question, which is how do you know when to bet on technology, even when everybody else tells you that you're wrong, because that's certainly been part of the story that we've had. Um, Erwin, let's, so let's kind of start back, back in uh, 1966. At the time, I believe that you were a professor at MIT and thinking of making a transition. Um, Bob Kahn was also a professor at MIT, mm -hmm. and I think that there was some debate at the time about who was going where. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I had the previous year taken a year off for our one visit to California. And we found we liked it. We actually, on a MIT professor's salary, we didn't have very much money, so we bought a used 
van, and there weren't very many vans at that time, camped cross country, spent nine months at JPL, camped back through Canada. Just after coming back, a uh, professor from Cornell, where I was the undergraduate, called to say there's a brand new university in San Diego, University of California, San Diego, where I come out and help set up the EE department. And of course, the first reaction, career, family, friends, everything's on the East Coast, so we turned it down. Uh, but for two days, we couldn't leave, live with that decision. And in fact, I often tell the story that the final straw, uh, the second day, there was a heavy rain in Boston, which is not unusual, took the subway, from MIT over to Harvard Square. You'll get my Boston accent periodically, I can't get rid of it. And had to get on a bus to get to Arlington where we lived and there were many people trying to get on the buses so it was about the fourth bus I finally managed to get on. Halfway to Arlington, everyone's wool clothing began to dry out. There was a terrible odor. I got home and I said, maybe we should take this job. <laughs> Called up and luckily it was still available. Uh, almost not available because Bob Kahn almost took it. Well, there were, in fact, there was another MIT person as well, so there was a little bit of debate going on. Uh, and in fact, luckily there was a professor, Norm Abramson, visiting from um, Stanford. And you know, one of the concerns about coming out here, and particularly going to San Diego, uh, the beach is awfully close by. Can anybody do any serious work? And looking around San Diego at the time, it wasn't 100% clear. Um, because we're mostly retired folks. And so I asked Norm that question, and he said, you're thinking about it the wrong way. He said, what you have to think about is that you can work very hard all day, and then in minutes be on the beach, so it's exceedingly efficient. <laughs> so I took his advice, and out we came. Right, right. Now, you weren't, you weren't there very long when you actually started consulting and, and really building a business. And in fact, Linkabit was the first company that you ultimately started. Uh, why do that? I mean, a professor has a pretty busy life anyway. What were some of the questions that you were thinking about, and, and what were some of the issues you were... Well, coming out here from MIT, and then with the large electronics, communications, aerospace industry, there were lots of requests for consulting, and when you teach, you consult perhaps one day a week. And so there were many more requests than could be satisfied. And one day, actually coming down from NASA Ames, uh, with Andy Viterbi and Len Kleinrock, I mentioned to them that there's much more consulting than I could possibly deal with. And they said, let's start a company and share the consulting. And I said, sounds great to me as long as I don't have to manage anything. And so that's how Link had been. In fact, we didn't, of course, have a name when we agreed to this. And so we submitted a list to the Commission of Corporations. Uh, and Link of it was about 11 or 12. And the previous ones were all used up. And so we finally came to link, link a bit. We came to link a bit, and we said, okay, we'll, we'll take that one. Nobody else had asked for it. And uh, we then began to grow, so we hired our first employee, and that first employee had to go off to a conference, and at the conference he knew he was going to have to wear a name badge with the word link a bit under it. He said, we've got to change the name. But we had already signed a few contracts, so it was too late, so link a bit. It was. So it was a consulting practice, which means that you're developing, you're solving other people's problems. You're, you're developing IP. You don't really own the IP. You have to give it off to them. What, what were a few of the things that you learned in the process? Of well, first this? of all, it's very frustrating to just be a consultant because mm -hmm. you give advice and most of the time people ignore the advice because uh, they've got better things to do. And so nothing quite happens. And when we started Linkabit, therefore, we were consulting. We also taught some courses because that's a good way to raise some money. Um, but we began to think how might we be able to develop a product. And we, Linkabit started out actually largely in the government business. Uh, that is, we managed to get some contracts from ARPA or DARPA, whichever way you want to call it, ARPA at the time. And um, uh, that gave us some cash flow. Uh, Actually, one of the interesting products uh, that came up, and I was just discussing this with uh, a couple of folks before, uh, we had a request from IBM. They knew we were in communications. We know about coding, decoding. Uh, Andy Viterbi was, uh, again, part of this. Um, and so could we design a decoder to go with a communication system based on time division multiple access for satellite communications? And uh, we said, of course, didn't know if we could or not, but of course we could. 
and began to work with them. And uh, then, as they were getting close to submitting a proposal for getting the job actually from Fort Monmouth, uh, it became clear that it was a humongous thing and that if one used several processors, small processors, to do a number of specialized jobs, you could make a much simpler device, many fewer unique cards, et cetera. And so uh, we suggested that. Of course, they said, that's crazy. Whoever has more than one computer in a system. Um, and so we didn't ever come to an agreement on having multiple computers. Uh, but our approach had ended up with a much less expensive, much simpler device. So they couldn't throw it out, so it went in as an appendix. And they priced it, unfortunately, on theirs. They lost the job, I think it was the Raytheon, uh, by uh, on a seven or eight million dollars, on a few hundred thousand dollars. Ours would have been several million less. But in any case, uh, we lost it, so that didn't go ahead. But the word got around that we had this approach, and so we did then get some jobs from the Air Force and began to move ahead, develop a product. And in fact, the product we developed, I think, was the very first. I'll have to get one for the computing museum. We can find it someplace. But uh, the, I think the very first, although the name didn't exist at the time, RISC processor, reduced instruction set processor, we had. Uh, we wanted to do a whole communications function that could talk to a number of different satellites be able to do that in a small uh, box. And uh, one of the major expenses was the read-only memory at the time. You know, we weren't very dense. And so thinking about it, uh, we came up with the idea of just having a smaller number of instructions, a few bits to represent which instruction. Uh, since there's a lot of signal processing, being able to hop back and forth among a number of different stacks as we went from one job to another. And went ahead and got this uh, device designed, uh, had to go around give lectures on microcoding, on, 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 on uh, how you use these processors to actually do signal processing and other functions. And uh, eventually the Air Force did give us a contract. Uh, then they realized that perhaps since you can have different code, you can work not with just one system. The original one was called Less 89 work with a second um, satellite system, and so we put some more code into the, into the box. That unit, uh, which was built back, designed back in the early 70s, built in the late 70s, is still in use. So uh, ROMs get more dense, and so you just add more code, start up being on AFSATCOM, then on this LES-89, and then ultimately on uh, Milstar. So it, it was kind of an interesting story. Uh, so we got into computers actually fairly early. So you're developing a business. You're, you're using computers' computation to really do a lot of the communications processing. Mm -hmm. And yet, by towards the end of the 70s, I think one of your colleagues said the crystal ball started to get a little fuzzy. And around that time, you wound up selling Linkabit to Maycom. Well, I wouldn't say it was a crystal ball because we had a lot of ideas for commercial products. The first nine, 10 years was, were largely government programs. In fact, this so-called dual modem became but, a but huge did production it, did job. did it seem at that stage that Linkabit was going to become a big company? Was there a big, bright future ahead of it or, or, or not? We thought there was, but we were not yet a public company. And so, and we were a systems company and we built some complicated boxes, but we didn't have the components. And so we actually merged into a company or sold to a company called Maycom, which had started out as Microwave Associates. And so they were in the components business. They were on the New York Stock Exchange. So it seemed like a reasonable thing to do to put the two together, systems capability and uh, components and um, uh, uh, company that was already public. And in fact, that, we grew quite well. And that company was, uh, for a company with profits, had about the highest multiple on the, on the uh, New York Stock Exchange for a couple of years. Uh, we began to do a number of other acquisitions. Things went very well. Uh, but you left in the end. And, there was a management and you change. Left and, and there were management, there yeah. were management Usual conflicts. Usual case too, with right? any time you do a merger and then things kind of get a little bit out of control. Um, that was a great lesson. And and what, so, what was the lesson there? But what, what was the lesson that you took away from that? Once you lose control of your company, even though uh, I was on the board, et cetera, you still don't control things. And some decisions you don't quite agree with will be made at some point either keep fighting them, or when they get, begin to get too much of a problem, then you decide, well, it's time to move on. And that's what happened uh, with Macomb. 
and so retired on April Fool's Day of 1985. And went back to work a couple of months later. Retired for three months unsuccessfully. <laughs> As is often the case. Now, when you started um, Qualcomm with, in fact, some of the people who'd been with you at Linkabet, uh, just out of curiosity, because someone asked me, why is Qualcomm always in caps? Only in caps, well, because it's, again, a little marketing. It, you, it shows up. <laughs> it shows up. Okay, so from the very beginning, you're thinking about the marketing of this company, even though you promised your wife or told your wife it was only going to be a little thing that you'd keep you busy. Huh? Well, Linkabit had grown typically 50 or 60% a year. We knew we couldn't do that again. So, <laughs> do you believe this guy? I'm not sure. <laughs> so, a sure hundred people here. sound like quite a reach at the time. Oh come and on! And so that's that's what we said. We just you know keep your hand in, keep some fun, be able to work with some good people, and maybe find something useful to be able to do in the world. Now, from 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 that position where you just want to have keep your hand in, all of a sudden you get involved in this project, Omnitrax which is a big, hairy project. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, we started probably in the first, again, we started without any particular products, so VCs would not ever have even looked at us. But um, uh, Right, so it's all privately funded. Yeah, right. We each put up our $500 or whatever. $500? That was a link a bit. This is probably $1,000. Okay, $1,000. <laughs> Times change, folks. Times change. It gets more expensive all, all the time. Uh, but, Did you take a salary, just out of curiosity? Uh, $35,000 a year. From the get-go? From the get-go. Okay. If we could have So you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna fund a company on $6,000 and take a $35,000 salary? So we had to go out very quickly and look for some consulting, some work to do. We thought it would be very similar to Linkabit, where we had uh, gotten a number of DARPA and government contracts very quickly. You know, if you have a good idea, the government would give you money. Those times had changed. It took a year's worth of negotiating to get any contracts, so that was not, in fact, the path we ended up following. But we did come up with several ideas. First of all, on Omnitrax, there was a small company in Los Angeles, uh, some people out of JPL that had been trying to build a sa communication system for satellites, uh, using satellites to provide uh, nationwide coverage uh, to talk to trucks. And uh, they had gone, been working on it, gone through about six of million. They had started with seven million came to us and asked if we could design such a product. Uh, we came up with some ideas. The story actually gets quite complicated um, in the sense that originally there was another company out there. The other company uh, was able to piggyback a device on a satellite that could receive from the trucks because you can put a receiver on a satellite piggyback without getting too much power. If you're going to transmit from the satellite, it would require a lot more power on the satellite. So the piggyback package could receive uh, from the trucks. We had a small golf ball sized antenna and some spread spectrum approaches that would allow us to receive from a satellite. So it made sense, let's get the two companies together. But that never worked out. So just as we were getting ready to think about going into production on receiving uh, from the satellite, we found out it wouldn't work. We had to go to a two-way system. And it's kind of an interesting problem. In fact, JPL had some fairly significant contracts out. How do you design an antenna with a reasonable amount of gain, say 18 to 20 dB of gain, that as a truck drives around will continue to point at a satellite and uh, give you enough gain to close the loop? And uh, in fact, it turned out to be a very difficult problem, as we thought about, because it had to be cheap and had to be reliable. And one day, I was talking to two of our business people and describing why the problem was difficult. And then partway through, I said, well, we need something like uh, one of those rotating beacons on a police car that just rotate. Well, I said, gee, those are pretty reliable. So then thought about having a rotating beam antenna on the uh, truck. And um, then... I won't get into all the technical stuff. How do you feed this? Well, if you just have a, a, a lead sticking up and let the chamber rotate around that, that would provide coupling without having to spend any money on an RF coupler. That sounded reasonable. And then the question is, how do you control this so it points to the satellite and tracks it? And so there was some signal processing, a whole bunch of things. In any case, we ended up with an antenna that cost about $65. <laughs> 
turned about to be exceedingly reliable, and many of the original ones that we first started selling back in 89 are still, still in use. But Omnitrax was going bust. The company, that's right, in, uh, uh, that was providing the money, uh, well, you had to pay for development, you had to pay for marketing, you had to pay for some transponders on a satellite, and you have no customers. It's a difficult <laughs> situation. Not good, not good. <laughs> so they began to run out of money, and we had a contract that, in fact, gave us a number of rights. Um, and so it turned out the best thing was for us to absorb them go out and raise a little bit more money from some angels and some uh, But that's a pretty friends. big decision. I mean, why not? Could you have walked away from it at that point? Could you have said, boy, this one's just going to be a little bit too hairy? I would say probably only 80% of the people in the company, of probably 20 people at the time, said we should walk away. But a few of us said, well, let's get, keep working at it. 80% said walk away, and you said no. But why? Why uh, stick with this? Especially well, if everyone's saying go away. There are two things. One, of course, is the beauty of technology, so you find something. But you've got to be careful about that, that you don't go off and work on something that doesn't have a significant financial potential. And just looking at it and having enough engineering background to try to judge about how long it would take us to build this and get it out there, not having enough sense to realize how hard it is to market a very high-tech device to the trucking industry. <laughs> Try that sometime. We went ahead and, uh, and completed that development, and I became a salesperson. So I was out talking with uh, different trucking companies. And What did you learn on your first sales call to a trucking company? Actually, the people running the companies uh, were very sophisticated. You had to be because they run on very low margins, and it is a fairly complicated business. Very, if it's a large company with many trucks out there, difficult logistics, a lot of computers being used to help control things, and terrible communications. And so what we learned is we had to put together a business plan for them that they would then understand why this would be useful. But secondly, that a device that communicates is not very, very good. You had to provide a lot of software uh, in order to make it into a system for them that they could immediately begin to use. So you're already starting to see that it's not simple, it's not enough to sell one product, that you have to develop a little bit more of an infrastructure around it. A whole ecosystem, as they say these days, right. right. And so we went ahead and, and had to continue to develop the software while we were, I was out trying to sell. And it turned out there's a very large trucking company called Schneider uh, National, uh, up in Green Bay, Wisconsin, so it gets a little bit cold for somebody from Southern California. Um, and we eventually did convince them to go ahead with the system. And there were some other possibilities. They began to realize that logistics, it was good to have communications, uh, but uh, there were other competitors. For example, meteors entered the atmosphere, they leave an ionized trail, people can bounce signals off of that, and so there were competitors out there with meteor trail approaches. We were leasing satellite transponders. Uh, and, and then there was this other company that was putting up specialized transponders. So there was competition. In any case, we did convince them. They did sign the contract. And um, we then went to see the second biggest company, a company called J.B. Hunt, and was in talking with Mr. Hunt. And uh, he was trying to negotiate a good price because he was going to be the first customer. And finally, I had to admit uh, that, indeed, we had already signed one customer. He immediately knew who that customer would have been and threw me out, you know, <laughs> unceremoniously. So a second lesson is be careful. He's now a customer. But be careful uh, who you tell your customers. Are. Right. Uh, marketing can be, and sales can be a rather tricky uh, activity. Yeah. In any case, uh, that uh, did succeed. Back in the early days, in, again, when we first started it in 95, uh, I'm sorry, 85, get my decade straight, um, one of the other ideas we had come up with under a contract with Hughes was the use of CDMA for satellite communication So, so let's pause for a moment, particularly mm -hmm. because this is archival, as I've been reminded a few times, CDMA. Give us the definition of the term and what did it mean at the time given the, the communications protocols that were available. Well, it stands for Code Division Multiple Access, and it involves using a spread spectrum signal. You take a narrow band signal, for, such as voice, and only maybe a few kilohertz, you either frequency hop it or multiply it by a coded sequence to make it very wide band, a technique that had been used in the military, and 
as a result, when you compress it back down, other signals that might be out there end up looking like noise. As long as your signal is strong enough, and I'll give you an example in a second, uh, and well enough coded, you can pick yours out of this background noise and therefore be able to communicate. It was actually on a drive back from talking with Hughes where we had this contract to look at what they had proposed, a much more standard satellite communication system for mobile communications. Halfway back down to uh, San Diego on the second visit, one of the things I suddenly realized was that the limitation on capacity for this CDMA technology is this background noise, background interference. One of the issues with one person, a mobile user, talking is that part of the time they're not talking. A few of us, probably not personally, but some others actually listen half the time. And, <laughs> and so how do you make use of that half the time? And also, of course, while you're speaking, occasionally you stop to think or there's a pause between syllables. How do you make use of that? Well, the standard system, you can't give up the channel, say a time division channel or a frequency division channel, and then get it back in time when you begin to speak again to uh, not end up with some distortion. And so with code division, it happens automatically. You stop speaking, you stop generating interference, and therefore you're not contributing to this background noise. And so that was the first thought on this drive back from Los Angeles to San Diego that said, hey, perhaps CDMA is the right technique to be used for this. Now, if we were here and everybody in this group was talking to their neighbor, but everybody using a different language, the language you can think of as being the um, code. And so everybody is using a different code and talking to their neighbor. And everybody else noises in your ears, but you can pick out that language from all this other roar in the background, focus on it, and be able to understand it. You'll miss some words, but with the error correction coding you put in, you, with the redundancy in language, you can kind of work over that. And so that's exactly what we end up doing in CDMA. The problem, and other people looked at, for example, CDMA for the cellular systems, although a couple of years after 86, uh, the problem is that if somebody is shouting in your ear and you're not trying to listen to them, that they will blot out the person you are listening to or will reduce the capacity. And so one of the issues with code division multiple axis is you need to have very careful what's called power control. Uh, even though someone's talking to somebody else, you're driving around, for example, a building comes between the two of you, you better up the power. The uh, suddenly come out in the open, you better reduce the power. Those things have to happen very quickly. So something called power control ends up being very important. In any case, we started out with the basic idea of code division multiple access, began to look at it, found a number of other advantages for code division multiple access, went back, spoke about it with Hughes. They thought we were crazy, quite rightfully. Uh, but and, and let's pause on that. They mm -hmm. thought you were crazy because why? What, what, were, what was their problem at this point? Well, did, they, did they have, I mean, in a sense, what you've got is a really cool idea. You've told us before with Omnitrax that you developed technology and then belatedly realized how many other pieces you had to plug in to make it work. Did Hughes have a sense of how many other pieces you would need? And, and well, this was before we that? had actually gotten CDMA I mean, got or Omnitrax working. Okay. So this was early in our, okay. our so history. So you hadn't learned the first lessons. I hadn't learned yet. even the first lessons. Okay. <laughs> And, and why is it crazy? Well, it, CDMA, it's kind of complicated to explain. I gave you a simple explanation, but then there are a lot of issues that immediately get raised. Uh, one, for example, again with satellites, although it's exactly the same for cell systems, you have not one antenna pointing down from the satellite to the ground, but you typically have an array of antennas. You can't keep them orthogonal. They overlap. And so some of the energy from one antenna will get into the neighboring antenna. How do you handle that with standard uh, technologies? Well, you use different frequencies in the neighboring beam. So you don't use your frequency spectrum as efficiently because you can't reuse the same frequency in every beam. In other words, the Hughes guys could say the number of technical problems you have to solve dwarfs the possibilities of your technology. And you could see it the other way around. Well, uh, one of the things also we learned is that you can say everything you want to your red in the face and put up, didn't have PowerPoint at the time, but draw some nice pictures, etc. And uh, 
still people, they won't find any holes, but they won't believe you either. And so ultimately and so you have, have to build, to build a demonstration. Something. You have to build something. Right. Well, in that case, it was before this, we actually did build a satellite simulator and a receiver and showed it worked. And that might have carried the day, except it became clear that any time you submit something to the FCC and expect to get an answer back, in a few months you're probably several years optimistic. And so it was clear that wasn't going to go forward for a while, so it was all set off to one side. Qualcomm, still being very tiny, not having the money to develop it further ourselves, decided that instead we would do the Omnitrax and proceed ahead. So as I mentioned, we signed up with Schneider in, these, some of these dates are burned in my head, in October of 89, and October, November, and it immediately began to look at the use of CDMA for cell systems and would it work indeed for uh, uh, terrestrial use as opposed to satellite use. Uh, we had now some contract, we had a little bit of money coming in, a little bit of profit, so we immediately began to vet your company again. And the more we looked at it, simulated it, we started reading books, what's the right models to use for cellular systems, etc. cetera, uh, trying to become instant experts. Um, we kept, you know, kept looking at it, kept looking promising. So the did next you think it was going to be big? Did you, did you ever sit around and have a discussion and say, wow, this could be a really huge industry? Or, or was it still a collection of interesting problems? Well, you're never quite brave enough to say that it could, for example, take over the industry. That you clearly you might a venture find, capitalist. Hopefully find a niche or something if you're, you know, things go well. You know in the back of your mind that it, if indeed it works the way you think it's going to work, that it has a great deal of promise. But you never really allow yourself uh, to get carried away. Uh, although one of our board members, uh, we went public uh, uh, in the end of 1991. And he said that even earlier, I had told him that we was basic, that was largely on the basis of Omnitrax, that I had told him before that this was going to be much larger than Omnitrax. And so at some point between 89 and 91, I began to get more positive about it. But uh, of course, it did turn out that way. Tell us a little bit about this first device over here. Well, as I mentioned earlier, you can't just tell people. You actually have to demonstrate things. So. We went out, we spoke to, uh, actually it was Pactel Cellular, uh, mentioned CDMA, they again thought we were crazy, but didn't find any holes, and so they kept encouraging us to work on it. The reason was that back in those days, cellular communications had gone past the stage where I guess a consultant had told AT&T that with any luck there may be to either 100,000 or a million users by the year 2000. And, um, uh, so it, it didn't look like it was ever going to be a very much of a business. Um, started out using FM radio, but it began to grow. And so people realized that they had to go digital as opposed to staying analog. And there were some people who did look at CDMA, gave up on it very quickly. Others that looked at time division multiple axis. Others looked at, code division, at the frequency division multiple axis in the digital, using digital modulation. Actually, the very first commercial TDMA, time division, phone was built at Linkabit, by us at Linkabit, but for another company called no, IMM, IMM, now called Interdigital, um, still making use of those patents. Uh, that's one time we learned that when you do something under contract and give up the uh, intellectual property, that may not be the right thing to do. We'll get back to that point. <laughs> In any case, um, the industry had a year's worth of debate between TDMA and FDMA, then decided in a vote, a very close vote, and I think both Motorola and at t were on the side of FDMA, uh, to go ahead with TDMA. We came along a month later to Pactel saying that CDMA may be the right way to go. Um, they were not happy with the previous decision in the sense it gave about a factor of three, and it's hard to introduce a whole new technology and only gain a factor of three in capacity. CDMA appeared that well done, it could provide a significantly greater capacity uh, than that. And so they were intrigued by that. Um, so we kept working on it. In June, we finally convinced the Cellular Telephone Industry Association, now industry has been changed to internet, uh, to go ahead and invite a group 
of industry people to Chicago to hear a presentation. And they felt, quite rightfully probably, that this would be a way of killing off this crazy idea. And so went and made a presentation on CDMA in Chicago in June of 89. And uh, nobody found a hole in it. In fact, the only major objection that came back, other than, again, nobody really believed it would work very well, uh, was that why were we talking to CTIA? We should have been talking to TIA, and I won't get into this, because TIA handles the standards. So, in any case, what would be the next step? Well, the only next step is to go ahead and build the demonstration, because otherwise, how do you convince anybody that indeed it does work? How do you show that this power control problem has been solved? How do you show in a mobile system that as you move from one cell to the next cell to the next cell, you can do a handoff between the cells in a very smooth fashion? We actually came up with something called a soft handoff. How can you show that using the same frequency on every antenna sector of each cell, reusing the same frequencies everywhere, uh, wouldn't cause unacceptable interference? Uh, how do you take care of what's called multipath? The fact radio waves bounce off everything in sight so you don't get one copy, you get multiple copies. So we had to go ahead and build a system. And this was our first mobile telephone. This Jerry box Hanley, right here. It? Actually, that's part of it. That's the digital part of the mobile phone. We had another piece that was the RF part. And so we did have a mobile phone. It took a van to drive it around, but uh, at least we could, could drive with it. And we built also, we built a few of these, and we built two cell sites to be able to show that handoff worked as well. Then we had to decide what was the appropriate time to bring people in for a presentation that this did work. And time was not working in our favor because uh, everybody was running ahead with TDMA. People were talking about going commercial with TDMA. If we got too far behind, then people would have waited and we would, would not have been able to break in. And a key decision, we had started basically working on this in June. We had targeted and talked with Pactel Cellular. They agreed they'd cooperate with us uh, November, early November, as being a time to demonstrate the system. Well, toward the end of September, we had to decide to send out invitations. Again, had a discussion with the various engineers. Were we safe in sending out invitations for the early November? And engineers being engineers, of course, I myself, but uh, being a little more risk-taking engineer, uh, said, no, it's too soon. Uh, but I looked where we were and had enough kind of understanding, et cetera, that uh, we had no choice. We'd better go ahead and send out the invitations, give ourselves a hard deadline. Anytime you have a hard deadline, you'll get it done. So we did. And we kept working kind of day and night. Um, everybody showed up. I was going to say, tell us about that November uh, okay. demo, though, because there were a few nail-biting yeah. moments there. So we had, I don't know, 130 or 40 people show up. We began some presentations. Pactel Cellular said why they were interested. We had some technical material. I began to present some other technical material. And then what they'd see on the demonstration. And just as about the time we're about to tell part of the people to go out to the vans to ride around, others to go to the... Uh, a laboratory to be on the ground, the, 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 the uh, terrestrial side, uh, someone started to wave their hand in the back of the room. Keep talking. It wasn't going to work. <laughs> so we kept talking. And luckily, it's good to have a professorial background. <laughs> that helped. And of course, with CDMA, it's complicated enough that you can keep talking forever on it anyway. <laughs> And so I kept talking. About an hour later, <laughs> luckily, people were beginning to fidget, but nobody had walked out. I got another signal, OK, for them to go out. And what had and, happened in that, in that hour? Right. One of the things we had done to uh, help the system save money when you're going to build it, uh, it's re first of all, you have to have some ac accurate frequency references in each base station, so you send out the right RF radio frequency. You can do that with a very expensive oscillator. You can do it with a less expensive oscillator if you have a signal to synchronize to, phase lock to. And we use GPS satellites to get both a frequency reference, but also a time reference, so we could also have the base stations 
time very closely together so we could easily do a code search and hand off from one base station to the next so if they're very well synchronized it's easy to do that what had happened that was early days with global positioning system satellites there wasn't a few full constellation one came over the horizon had a bug a glitch through the two base stations out of sync and out of frequency and it took us a while to figure out what the problem was and then to resync it and then to release everybody. So it wasn't our equipment, it turned out. It was GPS satellites. <laughs> guy. Having said that, it all worked. But, but at this point, it's late 1991. Qualcomm is almost out of cash. Probably beyond that point. Beyond that point. <laughs> Um, there's a, a, an interesting history book on Qualcomm, and I think the number it cites is it says you were down to $125,000, and that wasn't going to make payroll till the end of the year. You're out of money, and all the standards guys have voted for the other technology, TDMA. Um, did you doubt at that stage? <laughs> uh, well, I mentioned that building a demonstration to reassure everybody else was the reason for building it. But in fact, <laughs> it was to make sure that we hadn't missed some key point. And so it was reassuring to have done that. Of course, looking at this unit, you realize that you can't carry it around with you. And so there was a little more work to be done. And that little more work was to build, to make some IC. So take all these uh, various chips in here, Zionwing's chips, and make those into in, this, in our case, initially three ICs that we could build a small handset. But surely someone must have said to you, Erwin, this is crazy. You're out of time and you're out of money and you're behind the game anyway. My memory is that there were three or four people who didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> so why you, persist? Well, it, it, it sounded like the right thing. It, it, it would met a, a need for the industry. Clearly, there was going, it was a potentially growing industry. Technically, it seemed to have the right idea. The only question was, how do you generate enough money to keep your development going? And, and there's this handy we, thing called the stock market, isn't there? No. Uh, let's see. Get my years straight here. This was roughly in October. Yeah. We began to raise some money, and then, yes, we went out and did our <laughs> public offering. Uh, no, one, yeah, one second. Can. No, 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 no. I, throwing me off here. Okay, sorry. <laughs> this, was, this was done in 89. Right. And it took two years to develop the chips to 91. And so it was those two years we had a bridge. And what we did was actually came up with a bit of a uh, business plan to do that, which was the following. Go to people, major companies, and say, this technology has promised. You may be able to, uh, in fact, make use of it. Here's a chance to kind of get in on the ground floor, provide a license fee to us that would help us continue our work, sign up for royalties, and nobody mind signing up for royalties because probably this wasn't going to work anyway, and we'd be able to proceed ahead. So we did, in fact, manage to get some money, uh, some investment from some of the carriers, but then some money from some of the major manufacturers that gave us some funding to proceed ahead. With that funding, we developed the chips and then went out in exactly two years later, November of 91, to have a phone now this size and base stations that were commercial size and show that indeed this system would work. Everybody showed up again. Indeed, they were impressed. Um, impressed enough that, although again, the, the, the industry was very divided, um, they decided to have a conference called, I think it was down in Dallas, to ask the TDMA people, and TDMA was presumably essentially commercial at that point, and CDMA, and during the two years, by the way, we'd invited many companies in. We didn't work by ourselves because that would not have allowed us to convince enough people this could work. We brought a number of companies in to come up with ideas for testing CDMA. Everybody had an idea why it wouldn't work. Okay, let's build a test, try to implement this problem see how the system reacts, and so a lot of people had gained experience with it uh, by that point. But in any case, they said, let's go ahead and uh, you bring your technology to this meeting in Dallas. 
uh, and let's have a runoff. And so the TDMA folks showed up. Uh, they were on first. They showed some, uh, actually, some recordings of driving around, and it sounded atrocious, uh, very noisy. Uh, we had, in fact, set up high fidelity stereo speakers at the time. We had made videos driving around a van so you could see where, the, where you were. You could have uh, another view of a scope, seeing the multipath jumping up and down, and you could listen to both ends of the conversation, and it sounded beautiful. That was enough to convince the industry that perhaps they should think about having a second standard here in the US anyway. Europe thought this was crazy. And so we entered then into a period that was, a, again, a, a, a fight within the Cellular Telephone Industry Association. The compromise was that there would be five months of hearings where other companies could come in with their ideas for what's called a wideband technology. And then at the end of that, they would make a decision. We went through that period. We went ahead and developed a standard, uh, a draft standard during that time. Nobody else came up with a good competitor, and so we entered the standards process. That, by the way, is another question. Should you have a standard or should you a de facto standard or a de jure standard? Should you actually go through a standards process? Well, in communications, if you're going to sell that worldwide, you better have a real standard. And so we decided to do that, which took another year and a half out of our life. The interesting thing is the same chips that ran this phone were still usable when the standard was complete. In other words, the physical layer, the CDMA layer, did not change during the standards process. Some of the signaling did. Uh, 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 a number of the software aspects got better layered, et cetera. But uh, we actually survived as far as the physical layer. And so at the end of that standard, we were ready to go ahead with a commercial system. The first commercial system went into use in Hong Kong in roughly November, October, November of 1995. And so it was seven years from the time we began to look at this in November of 88 to the very first commercial system, which I think sets a record, actually. <laughs> Looking back at it... it set if, a record for gray hair. <laughs> if, you, if you had realized how many pieces of the puzzle, we haven't really even had a chance to talk about the work that Qualcomm did to develop infrastructure equipment, uh, handsets, obviously the chips. If you had realized all of the pieces of the puzzle that had to come together and the standards process, would you, would you have done it? The technical side probably wouldn't have scared me as much as the standards process because there you, you're one company with many other companies and you can never tell what's going to happen. So that would have, my, my original thinking was probably we go ahead as a de facto standard. But um, again, as many of you know, anytime you have a company, a young company, you have to take risks in order to have that opportunity to have a, uh, a good hit. You have to take risks, and there are also some things that you don't compromise on, right? There are core values, I think you've said, that you don't compromise on. What, what have been some of the core values that are not compromisable? Well, I, I guess, first of all, you comes from the name of the company, uh, so quality is always a key aspect, uh, quality in everything you're doing. We had to be very sure ourselves of what we were doing and that, indeed, it would work. Secondly, of course, you do go out and raise money, and so you have to be very honest with people that there is a significant risk and uh, that uh, they are at risk. But on the other side of that, again, as I'm sure many of you know, you always are really worried. 4 a.m. 4 is always the time you worry most about it that indeed you may not get there before the money runs out and of course then lose a lot of other people's monies. So there's uh, a set of things. Uh, the third is, uh, again, not saying anything everybody doesn't know, it's, it's, it's really the people in the company that count. So we were always very careful about selecting people to work with us, uh, never saying you have to work hard, you have to do this, but kind of providing very interesting work and then Everybody looks around, sees everybody working very hard, and so they work along. But you have to, uh, again, I think one core value is uh, giving everybody uh, room to introduce their own ideas, to listen to them. Uh, if, and always the case, some of them don't work out, that's fine. We try, we keep going. And tell us a little bit about Qualcomm's licensing strategy, because uh, Qualcomm has been 
quite notable in the industry for being pretty firm about its licensing plans. You, you don't compromise on that very much. Well, first of all, when we, uh, we did get one interesting example with Omnitrax because there we developed a product, we sold hardware, but we also sold a service that is a messaging service. And so we had an ongoing stream of income even after the hardware was sold. It's about $50 per truck that's out there, $50 per customer in a sense. And so that model was a good model. Can you do something that provides an ongoing stream of revenue that you can then invest in new ideas and kind of keep the pipeline full? And so the, when I mentioned earlier we needed the cash to go ahead and develop the chips to go ahead to the next stage, the idea of licensing uh, uh, the technology was clear. In order to do that, one needed to be very active on intellectual property, on patenting. Um, we had also learned that from the previous uh, examples at Linkabit. Uh, and so we did a lot of patenting the technology. We were also very lucky because everybody had given up on CDMA. Everybody was focused on TDMA. Nobody was really trying to solve a number of the difficult problems. And so indeed, we were able to generate a lot of the intellectual property uh, for that. And so we took a couple of paths. One, as I mentioned earlier, talking to local manufacturer, well, worldwide manufacturers. But we also decided that if you're going to be in communications, it has to be international business as well. And so uh, early on, we went to China, but in particular, we went to Korea. And Korea at the time was a country that was beginning to have some success uh, in manufacturing, but it was always based on low cost. They were competing with Japan. Japan would come out with technology first. Korea would then come out with some similar technology, but have to underprice the Japanese manufacturers in order to sell it. Japan had looked at the U.S., saw the U.S. was going TDMA. They decided they would go TDMA. They made a few changes in the technology, saw a different bandwidth. They reversed receive and transmit frequency so that U.S. couldn't ship equipment easily to Japan, but that would give them the expertise to ship this way. I think that was the reason. And uh, uh, in any case, uh, they were going TDMA. So one of the discussions we had with uh, one of the research companies in, in Korea, with the MIC, with the ministry in Korea, uh, was that here was a chance that they could take that CDMA would turn into a good technology. They could be in it earlier if they worked together with us. And uh, therefore, they could go into manufacture and be ahead of the Japanese manufacturers if this all worked out. So in about 92, 93, uh, they decided to go ahead with this. And so we signed a development contract that then led to further licensing uh, uh, with Korean manufacturers. Uh, and so the model basically was an upfront fee, so we had some money to continue development, and then a royalty to, uh, if this should be successful, on the manufacturer price of the equipment. Uh, we now have something over, well over 100 companies that have licensed the technology, and so that does allow us to uh, pretty much uh, uh, have some uniform terms uh, on that. You have very uniform terms. Do you think that will continue going forward in the future? Well, uh, there's, you always look in any business, so you can never say always, but you have to look at what alternatives exist out there. Uh, whether you have uh, enough strength to uh, make that technology, what you're contributing to it, be important. So one of the things you cannot do is stop. You have to keep running, you have to keep running fast. In our case, developed CDMA, largely focused on voice, but some on data. But since then, of course, going to what's called third generation, focused on data. We began to look at that, again, much before anybody else came up with a lot of the ideas that then become patented. And in the licensing program, uh, the agreements we sign, which become contracts, are that if you use one claim of one patent, that the royalty remains the same. So I've taken that position. There are three flavors of CDMA out there, two in use, and again, uh, same royalty rate for all the flavors in, in order to, again, keep the playing field level. Uh, that's worked reasonably well. Again, there are a few others out there with intellectual property on CDMA 2000, one of the flavors. 
a number more on WCDMA, which was developed, again, by a standards group largely in Europe, partly Japanese contributions, other contributions. But many companies, as you go through a standards process, many companies will then get intellectual property into the standard, and so there are more people with intellectual property there. Which makes it harder to enforce the same rules as you've had in the past. No. If, in fact, the key patterns and the essential patterns are there and you then sign a contract, then it goes on until they contract. Some have some time periods, and then you get into a renegotiation. The other thing we try to do is to, when we sign a contract, to try to get the other company to either agree that we can pass on any intellectual property they may come up with, or that, more often, that they would then license with some kind of cap if they had strong enough patterns. So we started out, and I've said this before as well, we started out as an R&D company. We got into manufacturing, became a manufacturing company. We began to manufacture infrastructure because in order to get CDMA out there, we needed to make sure that all the equipment, and so we could pass on the technology to others that that was available. To sell infrastructure, you have to finance your customers, so we got into vendor finance. We became a bank. That was the part that worried me most. Then with the intellectual property issues, we very quickly became a law firm. And nowadays, because there are so many governments that are very much interested in communications, because the dollars are so large, their own economies can depend on getting a very good communication system, their own manufacturers, their own operators, one gets into a lot of politics as well. So we go through a number of stages. I've got a lot of questions that I could keep asking, but we also want to open this up to you folks in the audience and give you an opportunity to ask Dr. Jacobs some questions. We're going to have some microphones, I think, somewhere. And when you do ask your question, please do stand up, use the mic, introduce yourself, and be respectful. If you ask your question too long, I will cut you off. Don't make me do that. My name is George Haber. We met, we talked about you putting up CDMA in Romania and at some conferences. I have two questions for you. One, there was a very interesting story about you having an email program, Eudora, that was very popular, and I used it. And then at some point, Microsoft invested $50 million, if I'm not mistaken, and Eudora went away, if you want to comment. And um, another one, it's, it's, it's an interesting uh, question about the style of management you have in Qualcomm. The common wisdom in Silicon Valley is that uh, family and business don't mix and match. Yet there are a lot of family members uh, working in Qualcomm. How, how does it help? Maybe this is the way to do it. There are other companies like Marvell that do that also. Just your comments. Right. Thank you. Well, with Eudora, actually, it goes back to Linkabit days. Uh, early on, we had a contract to uh, lead a program to extend the ARPANET over to Europe uh, using actually a satellite link. And um, there were a lot of companies around the U.S., a few, and you couldn't convince any of the telecom companies in Europe, the, uh, the PTTs, to pay any attention to packet switching. But um, uh, there were a couple of government labs, a couple of universities, and so we were running this project with people around the world and found that using email to communicate and keep track and work with one another was great. And so became hooked on email back in the early 70s. Um, when we started Qualcomm, uh, again, we began to look to see what email package to use and came across this uh, software that had been developed at the University of Illinois called Eudora. Um, began to use it, it was wonderful, but it only ran on the Macs, and so we adopted it over to the PC, and um, people began to hear, hear about that, and so they began to ask for support, and we finally decided, well, we'll make this kind of a commercial product. And um, it, in fact, did become quite popular. Uh, we reached the point where once Microsoft began to give it away with Windows, you couldn't sell it, basically, or you could, but in a limited fashion. But there have been enough supporters of that that we 
we, we continue to, to improve it, and I continue to use that. And now we have a push version to go uh, to use with wireless. Um, and so that, that was, again, not something we planned particularly. The best part of Eudora, other than being able to use it ourselves, uh, which was wonderful, is that many universities use it. It was, I think, the best recruiting aid that we had because who would have ever heard of Qualcomm, but many people had used Eudora, saw Qualcomm, and that kind of got us in the door. So that was a, a huge help. On the family side, actually back in Lincoln and at Qualcomm, um, the only rule we ever had was that a family member, if hired, could not work directly for another family member. But we also started out as a very young, well, a growing company, rapidly growing company. Many uh, people working for the company straight out of college, they'd be there day and night, they'd meet, again, very similar, I'm sure, to Silicon Valley, and get married. And so suddenly you ended up with a husband and wife, and then uh, over time, some children, some fathers, mothers. Uh, we never had a hard rule against that, and so indeed, I think there's probably quite a few family members uh, at uh, Qualcomm. Um, are you technically breaking your uh, no family member can work for the other family member with the succession plans that you have for Qualcomm? Well, a little bit, uh, referring to the fact. <laughs> if you think of working for, uh, for the uh, chairman of the board is working for a person, so it's, it's a little bit removed because it's not a day-to-day -day type by any means supervision. Um, but actually, uh, son Paul is uh, going to be CEO as of July 1st. Um, and that was an interesting battle itself. He received his PhD from Berkeley and uh, then did a postdoc over in France, came back and started a major battle in the family. Uh, my wife thought that for sure he should go off and, and teach at a university. And I said, we have too few well-trained, good people, because you never have enough. Uh, at Qualcomm, so he should come to work at Qualcomm. So we battled back and forth. Luckily, he did decide to come to Qualcomm and uh, has been there for, for many, many years. Uh, on, on, the, on the succession story, uh, that's obviously exceedingly touchy if you're a public company and something uh, we're very concerned about. Uh, so about three years ago, I asked, we had set up a governance committee a little earlier, uh, asked the governance committee that uh, they should take over full responsibility on succession planning, uh, that they went out then and interviewed uh, a number of the key executives within the company. First decision was whether or not to, at the right time, hire a CEO from within or go outside. And uh, if you're planning, if you're on a reasonable track and you want to keep the same culture, you tend to try to stay within. Uh, if you need to have some changes or get some new ideas or whatever, then I think you tend to go outside. In any case, uh, they decided we had enough reasonable, reasonably promising candidates within that then over this three-year period, they provide guidance and suggestions. I stayed, tried to stay out of it. I did stay out of it, um, other than if somebody asked some advice on uh, how to help with training in a particular role. Um, and then when I picked a date to retire. They then had their meetings, made a decision, went to the board, the board made that decision. So that's the way we handled it. We made the announcement about the succession, about my retirement and succession, at our um, shareholders meeting uh, beginning of March. And um, we had planned that rather carefully as to have uh, then some press meetings thereafter, be able to let people ask questions. Went through it, I had the person who led the governance committee uh, give a talk uh, to the shareholders as part of this uh, shareholder meeting. We then went into, we always have a very extended question and answer period from the shareholders. There wasn't a single question on succession. That really surprised me. They're just scared. <laughs> <laughs> What's the biggest disagreement you've ever had with your son about running Qualcomm? Oh, we've had a number of, of uh, disagreements where I was kind of worked through them. Uh, one of them, actually, early on had to do with CDMA. He was working on the vocoder at the time. I mentioned earlier that the TDMA vocoder didn't sound too good. The CDMA 
for a variety of reasons, uh, sounded much better, but still not the same quality as wireline. And with CDMA, you could go to a higher, uh, the vocodas, the, the coding of the voice, uh, depending on how much energy and, and, and frequencies, et cetera, uh, transmit a variable number of bits. So it, it's a variable rate vocoder. And we had a peak rate on the vocoder of 8 kilobits per second. Uh, if you went to a peak rate of 13 kilobits per second, uh, that would give a higher quality with the kind of processing we could do at that time. And so he argued we should go to 13 kilobits. I said, no, it's important to get out there sooner. I listened to him long enough, decided that he was right, and, uh, and we spent a little more time, got the 13 kilobit per second vocoder out. Uh, that did reduce capacity, and so there was a lot of press, oh, well, with that, they had a capacity claim of X, but now they're at Y. But the quality really won the day, so that, in fact, turned out to be a very good decision. Uh, of course, since then, we've gone back to the 8 kilobits, and, in fact, we now have, as you can put more processing on chip, uh, we now have even better vocoders at lower average data rates. It's the average rate with CDMA that generates the average interference that affects the uh, capacity of the system, and so you want to reduce the average as far as you can. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you. So. Um, you, Joel West, San Jose State. Uh, you mentioned the Governance Committee, and the chairman of that Governance Committee, Mark Stern, was quoted at saying at the time that one of the key issues in choosing an insider was the unique corporate culture of Qualcomm. So could you comment on some of the differences between your corporate culture and maybe what would be more typical in either a government-type company like Linkabit was once upon a time or a telecom company? And second, what were the origins of those cultural differences in Qualcomm? And in fact, were they intentional or was it just sort of work out that way? Well, first of all, actually, we developed a similar uh, corporate culture at Linkabit. So even though we started out with government work, uh, and then moved over to commercial work, uh, the approach there was one we then followed at Qualcomm. And I think it, one aspect of it was because of uh, coming from a university. A university has a tremendous advantage as far as coming up with new ideas, innovation, et cetera. Namely, you have a new class of, of students coming in every year, and they ask lots of questions, and that's the intent of a university is to laugh ask lots of questions, so keep everything stirred up. And the question is, in a company, how do you encourage people to ask the question to keep things stirred up intellectually? And so that was something we always have been concerned about. Uh, one of the approaches is to continue to bring in speakers, tell people even though there's a fire, we have to get put out by tomorrow morning, uh, take the time, listen, even though it may not be directly pertinent, and sometimes it's going to cause some ideas. So we tried to keep a... Uh, uh, an era of intellectual stimulation around the company, and that has continued. The other aspect, I mentioned email. Um, we try to keep a very flat organization. Uh, I, by nature, uh, like to think occasionally long term, but I always feel that it's important to understand the details of what's going on in the company. How do you do that? Well, as it grows particularly, the only way you can do it is by kind of being on a number of email lists, scanning through the email most of the time, passing, but occasionally either you see a good idea and notice it may not be being followed up on, or you see something that needs some attention, and you then go and talk with a supervisor or talk directly with the person. And so we don't have a particularly hierarchical uh, structure to the company, and, uh, and we jump organization levels, etc. And I think that uh, that's worked out very well. I've noticed when and we do, of course, hire some senior people periodically from outside the company that over half have problem adjusting to this approach. I mean, it's, it, it really bothers some people. Um, the other is uh, to, we, we do twice a year uh, reviews, performance reviews, uh, because we want them, in fact, to be very much merit-oriented, but if somebody's not doing too well, uh, you don't want to have to you kind of give some advice. You don't want them to have to wait too long to then get that improved and corrected. And so the, that, that approach has worked out well. Uh, but it's mostly, again, one of trying to be open, being trying to be stimulating. Uh, uh, there are various ways of, of running a company. Uh, one way you yell at everybody if they don't 
get something done in time or they don't meet numbers or whatever. Another is you try to understand the problem and, and how might you go about fixing it, more of an engineering approach. And so that's, that's the, the approach uh, that we've taken. Great. Thank you. Sir. My name is Alistair Davidson. I'm with Deloitte. Um, given that it took seven years for you to get from the initial idea to Hong Kong, can we ask you now to will be 3G and how much will be WiMAX? Well, uh, I think in seven years uh, it will be largely 3G, although uh, I suspect there may be a few in the audience that will uh, argue just the opposite. Um, the major difference is, first of all, 3G is expanding fairly rapidly at this point. Uh, there, uh, you don't have it here yet in San Francisco. There's a DO technology that Verizon has been uh, covering the country with. Uh, it's, by the way, all around Korea. It's now all around Japan, uh, many other countries, but they don't have enough spectrum here, but they're just getting the spectrum. Um, and uh, that gives a, a very good experience, and we continue to evolve that uh, uh, so that a very important aspect. There are a billion and a half people out there with cell phones today. You can't have a revolution. You can't change something and, and, and um, jump to something different and obsolete what exists today. So if you have a way of transitioning step to step, it works very well. So transitioning from the original CDMA to uh, the third generation initial version now to this DO with a very high data rate on the forward link, now to the next version, which has a high data rate and reverse link, very low latency, then from there to voice on internet protocol. Those kind of communication things are going to continue to occur. Uh, on the WCDMA side, a few year lag, but coming along very rapidly with, again, the high speed versions of those, high speed uplink, high speed downlink, uh, will be coming in, reduced latency, ultimately VOIP. So those all are moving ahead. CDMA is very spectrally efficient, and if you look at some of the other technologies that you might want to add and you begin to talk about wide area as opposed to a very different situation of local area networks, wide area networks where you want to cover a reasonable sized uh, region, things like MIMO, multiple input, multiple output, don't buy you anything additional uh, over um, having a moderate number of additional antennas, particularly at the cell site. And so one can go through a whole set of technical reasons why CDMA actually has a very good spectral efficiency, why it already is out there and improving. So I think the next seven years, the big changes are going to be this, this evolution, but in particular, the evolution of the handset. And this was our first commercial handset, the one that was in fact used in Hong Kong. Uh, it, uh, we originally started out with three trips, three chips, to do the digital part of CDMA. Of course, Moore's law keeps running along. And now, if you look at the chip that does CDMA, it's a small fraction of that chip. And so on that same chip, we're now putting initially one very powerful processor. We're now going to two powerful processors, one optimized for speed, one optimized for low energy usage. Uh, and a lot of special functions to do 3D graphics, to do GPS correlations, uh, to uh, uh, handle some of the functions of, of uh, video and, and camera picture processing, a uh, whole range of things. The phone itself is going to continue to evolve. My own belief is that for many of us, uh, first of all, it's going to be essential. You can't leave home without it. Uh, certainly, you want to place a telecom, but it does so many other things for you. One of those that we found out has to do with uh, again, in Korea, Korea, Korean, the operators and manufacturers tend to move very quickly with this new technology that we can generate. So, again, the first DO networks were around Korea. They began to offer that, and suddenly we found that a good percentage of the usage was receiving video on the phone. Uh, video clips, uh, streaming video, uh, sporting events, um, uh, news, some other things we don't talk about. Um, <laughs> It turned out to be a significant usage of the phones, uh, but you'd like to be able to price that at a good price point. To do that, you have to be efficient. So then 
we've the next step really is providing a better broadcast capability to the phones and that can be done within the cell network or on a different frequency band so my own belief is that we're going to see tremendous evolution on the handsets they indeed will become very powerful already are but become even more powerful computers my one perhaps regret back when we named Qualcomm I had debated whether we should have two M's on the end or one two M's were for communications one it could be either communications or computers now the devices we're selling are largely computers in some sense so we probably should have gone with the one M but it's too late sir Roy Mize retired analyst and R&D business manager as a commercial entity uh, why was Global Star such a spectacular business failure, and what was its impact, financial or otherwise, on Qualcomm? Good question. When we very first started, we had, again, a contract. We went from uh, DARPA on building low Earth orbit satellites uh, for a military program. That military program at some point ran out of funding, and um, we had some visitors from up here, but it was then called Ford Aerospace, uh, the laboratory. and. Uh, uh, they came in with some people from Ford. It's a long story. You know, my stories usually are, um, and um, said, "Can we put an Omnitrax on a car?" And I said, "No, it's kind of a 11-inch type diameter uh, antenna that wouldn't look too uh, too good on a car." Um, but if we had low Earth orbit satellites, thinking back to this military program, we could get by with a very small antenna. And they went off and. A year and a half, I don't think anything happened. Loral bought that, bought uh, Ford Aerospace, heard about this, came back, and that was the genesis of Global Star. Global Star um, was uh, to be 48 orbiting satellites um, and uh, handsets. Uh, same, roughly the same time. Motorola came up with the idea for another similar program called Iridium, and so suddenly rather than having one such, you had two such programs going on. Um, the question then was, how do you build these and how do you market them? And I myself think we probably could have gotten through with appropriate marketing, but one of the strategic approaches, and it's you know always how do you handle these things, one of the strategic approaches was rather than having a single company marketing around the world being able to control things, and particularly their pricing, uh, the decision was to have strategic partners, namely generally cellular operators around the world, who would uh, provide the function within their com com countries. That was helpful, by the way, in getting licensed, but not helpful in the sense they were mostly focused on cellular and not on Global Star. And so it was very hard to get a uniform pricing, to get things to happen quickly. Uh, Loral, which was running the business side of this, uh, tried to focus on more horizontal sales and specific vertical sales into certain markets. In any case, it did end up going into bankruptcy. It's now back out of bankruptcy, and we're scrambling very hard to keep up with the demand for phones. So it's kind of a, an interesting evolution. Uh, technology uh, works very well. I perhaps got the most heat recently when I... Um, we did a demonstration with American Airlines. We had a little CDMA Pico cell that's something about the size of a, uh, uh, a briefcase that goes uh, on the airplane, a couple of small antennas. And so if you had a standard cell phone, it would lock onto the Pico cell in the airplane, communicate with the Pico cell to provide the, feed, the, the connection from the Pico cell to the ground. We actually went through Global Star. And um, so we were using Global Star there. Somebody could dial your cell phone number on the ground, not know you were in an airplane, your phone on the airplane rang, and you could carry on a conversation. The reason we got a lot of heat for that was people said, oh, the last thing I want is my neighbor to be using a cell phone on the airplane. Yeah. We tried to explain, it's going to be interesting to see how it all works out, <laughs> no. that in fact there's a lot of background noise on an airplane, so if you do talk in a normal voice, the vocoder only picks up your voice, ignores the background, and the other person can hear you but we'll see how that all goes Respect ahead. In any case, that was another sound. use of Global Star. Um, we're getting close to the end of time. Uh, if the audience is willing, we'll take the last two questions. Okay, but we'll make them short answers, right? Oh, <laughs> we'll try. Okay. Hi, it's Steve Lawson from IDG News. If the carriers want to, uh, I'm sorry, as WiMAX evolves, 
um, carriers that want to provide a high-speed uh, mobile data service uh, can go ahead and start using WiMAX and they won't have to uh, license anything from you. Uh, what's going to keep them, how are you going to keep them from doing that instead of continuing along the CDMA paths, the 3G paths, and licensing things from you? Well, let's see. WiMAX uses OFDMA, so it's not CDMA, so in that sense, CDMA patterns don't cover it. The question is, of course, how will that move ahead? You talk about being able to use that around the world. Uh, one of the problems is you need a frequency band. There was some feeling that one could get by with unlicensed frequency bands and somehow get some of that spectrum around the world. Um, it turns out if you're going to use a wide area coverage, you can't allow other people to come in and interfere with you. I think everybody now understands they have to use licensed bands. Then the problem is how do you get licensed band around the world? Typically, the only ones available uh, largely are above the existing 3G 2.1 gigahertz. The higher the frequency, the harder it is to penetrate a building. Even 3G, it's a little hard to penetrate buildings. And so there's a cost to providing that. What do you get for that? First of all, WiMAX, which has a tremendous advantage over CDMA 2001 XE VDO or WCDMA HSDPA, uh, one of the great advantages is it has the name. But it's still not a technology in the sense that there's a fixed technology uh, that, in fact, the standard's pretty much done, but nobody has standard equipment and there's a whole range of interoperability. The mobile is still to be done. Whether one can do that and not step all over a number of people's patents is open. Um, but that needs to be done. It then needs to be tested, then iterated, carried out. Back in, I think it was uh, February, end of February of 2001, I looked at where WCDMA was at that time and then had an interview with the Financial Times and said that it would be 0405 before there was much WCDMA. Took a tremendous amount of abuse from people that said I didn't know what I was talking about. Uh, I was trying to argue for CDMA 2000, which is the other flavor. Uh, but in fact, that's what's happened because it just takes time, particularly with a mobile technology. Now you might say, well, can you make a business out of the fixed technology? I suspect it's possible. But my own belief is that mobile, once you and again with EVDO technology, HSDPA technology, you can offer basically almost all you can eat at a fixed price. You might have quality of service so that if someone really begins to use too much, you lower their quality of service so they get a little less usage during the busy times. But um, uh, you now have, you're paying something for a, uh, a very high data rate, very good service that you can use anywhere, why would you pay extra to go to a hotspot to make use of that? And so I don't think there's really a separate business there. And unless WiMAX becomes indeed mobile, I think it's hard to compete. Finally, how do you transition from one technology to another technology? You better support both for some significant time period. In order to support both, that means with 3G, you have CDMA in your phone. Well, now you're a friend of ours. Yeah, you have to pay him royalties again. Okay, sir. Uh, hi, I'm Barry Medoff. I'm going to end with a philosophical question. I, I can imagine if you uh, stayed in touch with your old friend Leonard Kleinrock over the years and kept up a dialogue, uh, you telling him, you know, Len, uh, this Internet stuff, this is a gold mine with the right packet patents on your pack, packet routing techniques, why, you'd be off to the races. And I can imagine him saying, uh, no, 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 uh, Erwin, that's, that's it's the other way around. Uh, you, keep the, you keep the techniques uh, open, uh, largely royalty-free, as many of the Internet te techniques are, uh, and, and you foster their adoption by, you know, globally uh, create industries, and it's much better for everyone. Uh, and besides, uh, long-run, uh, open, uh, freely available techniques will triumph over the proprietary techniques because more people can get to them, they can innovate with them, and ultimately they'll advance faster. And some would say, in fact, you're seeing the beginnings of that even in wireless communication with some of the developments that we've been talking about. So I guess my, my question is, uh, uh, do, you, do you have that dialogue with him? And, uh, and if so, uh, who wins? Well, I think if you ask Lynn Kleinrock, and I haven't asked him that question recently, uh, whether he would like to have something proprietary that people paid him for versus not, I have a feeling I know his answer. 
So I, you may be misreading it, or I may be misreading it. But I, uh, uh, secondly, there's a difference between open and proprietary. Uh, when you have a standard and it's published and people can manufacture to that standard, in that sense it's open. And I'll get back to open source in a second. Uh, uh, proprietary means that people have some licensing rights. You may have to pay some royalties. Um, our uh, approach indeed has been to say, okay, let's have this open, have many manufacturers around the world that can manufacture, uh, but there will be some price uh, on royalties uh, to be paid for that. Uh, you might say, well, does that work or not? Well, there are, what, a quarter of a billion people uh, over that, actually, on CDMA these days, probably more than have laptops with uh, open so way fire with open source software. So indeed, yes, as long as that number is small enough, and you keep working hard to move the technology forward, that is, you use that income, you don't simply bank it, but you, you, you reinvest it, uh, then indeed I think it indeed uh, continues to grow the industry. Um, open source code I think is very good. I think there's some issues legally uh, with using open source uh, that one has to be awfully careful about. Uh, but, uh, you know, there are times when you want that, uh, available, people would be able to look at it, study it, examine it. Other parts that you may not, uh, that may be more tightly controlled. Uh, again, depends on business models. There are a lot of different business models. Um, so I feel comfortable with the approach we've taken in the sense that it's allowed an industry to grow worldwide and grow rapidly. I do admit that there are some who say that uh, it's unfortunate Qualcomm collects some royalties on that. But if you look at the total Qualcomm revenue from CDMA versus the industry revenue from CDMA, it's a very tiny part. So it's, I, I think it's worked, but there are a lot of different business models. I guess the and I'm always not, open to yeah. any of these ideas. I guess it's not um, whether it's good or bad, but it's rather whether the, uh, open, the other techniques, the open and royalty-free techniques, can give you a run for your money. Oh, well. Um, There is a need, again, there's, there's, there's always questions. Let, let me raise one with you. Um, there's an issue of efficiency. Spectrum is, a, is limited and very expensive. People have to, particularly licensed spectrum, people have to buy it from governments. Even I just noticed today in the, in the uh, email that India that had not been auctioning their spectrum is now thinking of going ahead and auctioning their 3G spectrum. We did in this country. In Europe, people paid over $100 billion for 3G spectrum. So spectrum is very dear, very expensive. You want to use it efficiently. So you have to look at technology and say, which one uses it most efficiently? In this case, CDMA, although again, people, some people argue, uh, I claim theoretically and practically uses it most efficiently. And then the question is, okay, if I can avoid paying a few percent royalties, but I go to something that's more expensive, am I ahead of the game or behind the game? So there's an economic calculation to be made. Finally, there's a time to market issue. Do you have products out there? Uh, are people using them? Is most of the emphasis no longer on that particular aspect of it, but more on what software you can download to the phones, what uses, what uh, applications, what... Uh, uh, kind of exciting things can you do? What's in medical? What's in e-government? What's in education? whole range of things. Those will end up being the ones that really drive it. So we shall see. Thank there you. are other people betting in other directions. Uh, as we bet a long time ago, it's often well worth making these bets, but sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. Well, thank you all very much for joining us this evening. And please join me in thanking you. Thank you.